My name is Jonathan Goforth. I am so excited that you're watching this video because it means you're about to go take the real estate test. You're about to enter into what I believe is the very best career ever. This is my 25th year as a full-time realtor. Uh, yeah, I've been doing it 25 years. My last three years, I've been fortunate to be listed in Forbes magazine as one of the top market leaders in the country. So I'm so excited that you're tuning in to take the real estate test. I'm gonna ask four things of you first. Number one, please give this video a like. Number two, subscribe. So all my videos are free. I'm not gonna ask you ever for any kind of money or anything at all. Every one of my videos is free. If you just subscribe, click the word right there, subscribe. And then next to that is a little bell icon. You're gonna to wanna to click on that, turn that on. That way you get notified of future videos. Now I've got a lot of other videos, but right now, all I want you to do is focus on passing the test. I want you to practice test questions, lots of them. I've got 25 questions on this video. We're gonna go through them pretty quick. And then uh, in the remarks, the description of this video below, at the very bottom of this video, I'm gonna put a whole bunch of other links, and those are more test questions. So the real estate exam, whether you're doing uh, becoming a real estate agent now, or you're already a realtor and now you're going to take your broker's exam, there are two components of the exam. Uh, questions like what we're about to do now, multiple choice questions. The other component of the exam are the national simulations. You've got to know those. You've got to understand how those work. I've got links below on how to practice those national types of questions. So after you pass, and you will pass, because this is the best career ever, we want you to work really, really hard practicing questions before you go take the exam. Then come back to my real estate videos and check out all my other topics. Everything about how to help you make a lot of money in real estate, how to get leads, how to do this, how to do that. That's all in my other videos. But right now, let's cover 25 different questions to help you get ready to go pass the test. So let's start with number one. And a lot of these are gonna be memorizing vocabulary words. So if you know what the word blockbusting means, then you can answer any question. So number one, an example of blockbusting would be, one, when real estate agents alert residents of a neighborhood that their area is changing due to unwanted people moving in and they should sell before values fall. Number two, when lenders refuse lending to a certain targeted segment of a city. Number three, when insurance companies refuse to insure homes in a targeted segment of a city. Number four, when a realtor steers buyers to a targeted segment. Your answer is number one, when real estate agents alert residents of a neighborhood that their area is changing due to unwanted people moving in and they should sell. That is blockbusting. Number two, Involuntary methods of conveying property include all of the following, except as cheat, adverse possession, quit claim deeds, or condemnation. So one of these is a voluntary way that a homeowner can convey property. The other three are involuntary methods. Your answer is quit claim deeds. That is the only one on here that is a voluntary way of conveying property. Number three, you sold a home near a large airport. The flight patterns have been permanently changed with the addition of a new runway, resulting in a 25% loss in property values. This is an example of material obsolescence or location obsolescence. Number three, economic obsolescence. Or the last one, functional obsolescence. Your answer is number three, economic obsolescence. That's a cause of depreciation that can occur because of factors not related to the subject property. So number three is your answer. 
Uh, number four, functional obsolescence would not be correct because that occurs when a service or an object is no longer wanted, even though it's still in good working order. For example, a heater in a very hot climate. That would be functional obsolescence. So your answer here is number three. Number four, which of the following liens would take priority? Now this one's a little bit tricky. For some reason, a lot of people miss this one. This is why I put this on here. I want you to memorize this answer. Again, which of the following liens would take priority? An IRS tax lien, this year's real estate taxes, a judgment lien filed three weeks ago, or a mechanics lien? Your answer is this year's real estate taxes. For some reason, a lot of people will pick an IRS tax lien because it sounds intimidating. That's not the answer. This year's real estate taxes always take priority. The right of a defaulting borrower to keep title to a property by satisfying the debt prior to the foreclosure sale is called equitable redemption, a trustee's sale, statutory redemption, or remainder rights. It's a little harder one. Again, this is more vocabulary memorization. There's two types of redemption, equitable and statutory. Those are your two types of redemption. Equitable is your answer. Equitable is reclaiming the property before a foreclosure sale. That means you satisfy the debt before foreclosure. Statutory is reclaiming it after foreclosure. So your answer is equitable redemption. One loan was obtained in using 12 properties as security. This type of mortgage would be called a package mortgage or a purchase with hard money not backed by Fannie Mae, an open-end mortgage or a blanket mortgage. Your answer is a blanket mortgage. Now let's talk about what a package mortgage is because some people will pick number one. You might see a package mortgage as a correct answer somewhere else. So let's talk about what that is really quick. So a package mortgage is where you can use both real property and also personal property for the security on a loan. Uh, for example, using a farm and also farm equipment to take out a loan. That's what a package mortgage is. Is also with personal property. But for this, your answer is a blanket mortgage because it's only 12 properties is being used as security. Number seven, a bill of sale is a document used to transfer what? Number one, upgrades on a new construction home. Number two, personal property. Number three, real property. Or number four, easements. A bill of sale is a document used to transfer what? Your answer is number two, personal property. So we use a bill of sale to um, transfer furniture or a lawnmower or maybe a washer and dryer that's being sold to a buyer. Okay, on this question, I just wanna make sure you guys know there are commercial questions on your test. So you're gonna see some questions like this. When leasing commercial space, and the rent is based on the gross sales of a business, the lease is a net lease, a gross lease, a percentage lease, or an open-ended lease. So whether you're gonna sell commercial real estate or not, you're still gonna to have to be familiar with these questions and know the right answers. So in this case, the answer is a percentage lease. That is your answer. So the amount of rent paid is determined by calculating a percentage based on the gross receipts of the lessee's business. For example, somebody who is renting a parking lot could use a percentage lease to pay their rent. Which of the following types of legal descriptions describes property by starting with an identifiable point and then describes the succeeding sides by direction and length. Rectangular, rural, meets and bounds, 
or county, block, and lot? The answer is number three, meets and bounds. Now, sometimes you're going to be tempted to put number four because that's how most property is going to be described. But for this, that's an exact description of meets and bounds. The primary purpose of a deed is to prevent adverse possession or transfer title rights or prove ownership or to give material notice. So the primary purpose of a deed is to transfer title rights. That's what it does. It does not prove ownership. That's what a title policy does. So if it asks you what's the primary purpose of a title, that would be to prove ownership. But this is asking about a deed. So make sure you pay attention to that word. Some people will pick prove ownership, not realizing that said deed and not title. The purpose of a deed is to transfer the title rights. All right, let's do a math question. So number 11 is going to be a math question, give you some practice. So nobody likes math questions. They are intimidating. They are definitely a little more time consuming, but the test allows for all of this and the total amount of time you get to take the test. The math questions are not that hard, but let's look at this. Um, in fact, to give you a little peace of mind, I've, I've heard that if you don't miss any questions on the test, you get all of them right, except the math questions. You miss every single math question get them all wrong, you will still pass the test. There's not that many math questions on the test. So, number 11, a house sold for $300,000. The buyer is taking out an 80% loan with a 4% interest rate, had to pay $4,000 in closing costs, and three discount points. What is the total amount due at closing by the buyer? Take a look at that for a moment and then I'm gonna show you how to do this question. The first thing I'm gonna do is take $300,000 times 0.8, and that gives the loan amount, which is 80% of $300,000 is $240,000 loan. I'm gonna take that times 0 0.03 points, because we have three discount points. This is the first thing I'm going to do. So 3% of the loan amount is $7,200. That's our first cost we're going to figure. So our next step is figuring out the down payment. So I took $300,000 minus the loan gives us $60,000 down payment. You could do it like that, or you could take $300,000 times 0.2, which would get you the same number. And that's 20% of this. This was 80% of this. So we want to get what that 20% is because the buyer's taking out an 80% loan, which means they're doing 20% down. Now let's read this question again. A house sold for $300,000. The buyer is taking out an 80% loan with a 4% interest rate, had to pay $4,000 in closing costs and three discount points. What's the total amount due at closing by the buyer? This 4% interest rate is irrelevant. Don't need to know that. Doesn't have anything to do with uh, figuring out the cash the buyer needs to bring. So what we have, the amount of points, $7,200 plus $60,000 down payments, and then they give us $4,000 in closing costs. We're gonna add those three up, and that's how much is owed by the buyer. So here's the answer to this question. We have $7,200 in points, $60,000 in down payment, plus $4,000 in closing costs. The buyer's bringing $71,200 to closing. That's the total amount due. That is your answer. See, that question's not that hard. But part of it, when you get into these math questions, sometimes they're gonna give you too much information and it becomes a little bit intimidating, a little bit overwhelming. This 4% interest rate, has you don't, don't even need that. It's not even needed to calculate the answer. So there's really not as much in there as it appears. 
That's a really good math question. That's a very typical question. Um, play around with that, practice that. And um, there's, a, there's an easy math question point for you right there. Let's talk about number 12. This is an example of just learning some vocabulary. So we're gonna talk about this question, gonna give you the correct answer. Then I'm gonna talk about what all four of these are. And just so you have these memorized. Number 12, after a stream flooded due to heavy rain and then receded, the flow of water removed a strip of land along the riverbank. This would be known as accretion, reversion, alluvion, and avulsion. These are your four choices on this. Your correct answer is avulsion. Avulsion is an abrupt change in the course of a stream that forms the boundary between two parcels, resulting in a loss of some land. Accretion, which is your top choice, accretion is an increase by natural growth. Reversion is when somebody loses title and then the title reverts back to another. And then alluvian is the increase in land when waterborne soil is gradually deposited. So the only one that takes away is avulsion. This is a question that I really want you to memorize. When I first took my real estate test years ago, many years ago, I remember this was on my test. When I got my broker's license, I saw the same kind of question again. So which of the following is an encumbrance? So my question to you, what is an encumbrance? This is what you need to make sure you remember for the test. What is an encumbrance? So an encumbrance is a claim against a property by a party that's not the owner. It affects the transferability of the property and it restricts its use until the encumbrance is lifted. The most common types of encumbrances are mortgages, easements, and liens. And so your answer to this is all of the above. And I want you to make sure you remember that's what an encumbrance is. Okay, before we read this question, I'm gonna give you a few little tips on taking an exam, especially an exam like this, because as we get a little older, <laughs> these exams are not as easy. They're time consuming and we're not used to sitting in a chair for a long time uh, going through questions like this. Some of the questions are like this. There's a lot of reading. What I want you to do, one test taking tip, read every possible answer before you just pick one. And a couple other things, get there early, get to the test early. And when I took my broker's license, I still remember I'm sitting in there and I'm starting to take the, the exam. I'm stressed out. I'm, I was older, you know, obviously, compared to when I took my first real estate test. And the woman behind me starts sighing on every question. I just said, ah, she just keeps sighing. Well, that's really stressing me out. So if your test taking place, if this place offers earplugs for you, then wear them. I put these earplugs in and um, that way I, I got rid of her distraction. She was stressing me out. So let's talk about this question. Number 14, an example of an easement in gross is the right of a roofing company that is re-roofing a house has stored some of their supplies slightly onto the neighbor's yard. Next, um, it's, it's an example of easement and gross is the right of kids playing football in their yard as well as the neighbor's yard. A painting company you have hired to repaint your house and park their trucks on your driveway. Or a utility company to access your property to maintain the wires or pipes. That is your answer right there. So an example of an easement in gross is a utility company to access your property and maintain wires or pipes. The Federal National Mortgage Association, which is called FNMA or Fannie Mae, is a federal agency that buys FHA and VA loans. Or 
a federal agency which acts as a watchdog on the primary mortgage market, or a government-sponsored private corporation designed to assist the primary mortgage market, or a federal agency that insures all types of mortgage loans. So this is pretty much the definition of what Fannie Mae is. So two things I want you to remember on this question. What Fannie Mae stands for, it's the Federal National Mortgage Association. Remember that, that is Fannie Mae, Federal National Mortgage Association. It's FNMA, or we called it Fannie Mae. The answer is the third one down, a government-sponsored private corporation designed to assist the primary mortgage market. It is not a federal agency. That's what the other three have in common. I have a feeling you'll see a question similar to this. It is not a federal agency. Remember, that's the big thing I want you to remember. That's where they're gonna trick you up. People think it's people think it's this one. This is the common answer. A federal agency that buys FHA and VA loans. That is wrong. So remember, it's a government-sponsored private corporation. That could also be something you will see. Is Fannie Mae a private corporation? It is. Government-sponsored private corporation designed to assist the primary mortgage market. Number 16, the type of real estate ownership that is the most all-inclusive is fee simple, absolute estate, reversionary interest, life estate, or qualified fee estate. Your answer is this one. The fee simple absolute estate. Now a reversionary interest is that interest in property that exists when the ownership of that life estate reverts back to the original at the end of the life estate. And then a life estate is a freehold estate that lasts as long as the life of the life tenant. And then a qualified fee estate is limited by specific conditions. So the most all-inclusive is this one. Regarding the federal truth in lending law, which of the following must be disclosed to a borrower when taking a new first mortgage? That kickbacks to realtors are prohibited. The total amount of interest that will be paid during the life of the loan, how much the limits are regarding the prepaid items of taxes and insurance, or last, the annual percentage rate, the APR. Which one do you think? Regarding the federal truth in lending law, your answer is this. That's the only one on here governed by the federal truth in lending law. Those other three are governed by RESPA. Regarding the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which of the following can a lender not do? Verify a borrower's income sources. Refuse a borrower who is receiving income from public assistance. Tell the applicant within 30 days of denial or granting of credit. Or last, give specific reasons why the credit was denied. They cannot refuse a borrower who is receiving income from public assistance. Which of the following would be classified as a general lien? A judgment lien, property tax lien, real estate property tax lien, or a mechanics lien? Well, your answer is a judgment lien. So a judgment lien is placed on all the assets of a debtor in general. Whereas a property tax lien, which is both of these, property tax liens are specifically placed on the property that's delinquent in taxes. And then number four is a mechanics lien. So a mechanics lien is also specific to the property where someone is trying to get paid on work or supplies that were performed at that specific property. So hopefully you're feeling pretty confident going into the exam with what we've gone over so far. Um, this would be a great time just to mention again that in the remarks of the video, underneath the video, 
click on the description, the remarks about it. I've got more links. So if you need some help with um, reviewing some national simulation questions, I've got some down there to help you out. And of course, it's a great time to always ask, if you didn't subscribe yet, please click subscribe so you don't miss out on everything else to make you a big success in real estate after you get this test passed. Number 20, the amount of loan expressed as a percentage of the value of the property getting the loan placed against it is called the debt to equity ratio or the secured debt ratio or the appraisal or the loan to value ratio. Now this is something that will come in handy. Every time you write an offer on our contract, we've got a blank for when we disclose who the lender's going to be in that financing section, we are to disclose either the loan to value ratio or um, how much their loan balance is gonna be when they take out their loan. And that's why the fourth one down is your answer. It's the loan to value ratio. That is the answer. So the LTV is loan to value. That is the amount of the loan expressed as a percentage of the value of the property getting the loan placed against it. For example, if somebody's getting an 80% loan or maybe it's an FHA loan, they're doing 96.5%, that is the loan to value ratio. So that's a very good one to make sure that you know that. In determining total square footage of a home being appraised, the appraiser should use inside dimensions, outside dimensions, the net square feet after removing closets and stairs because they are not living space. Or number four is lot dimensions. Your answer, outside dimensions. A lot measured 80 feet by 100 feet with the front being 80 feet across. It was valued at $3 per square foot plus $20 per front foot. What is the total value of the lot? Now I'm gonna show you how to figure this. So this math question really isn't all that bad. We have 80 by 100 feet equals 8,000 square feet times the $3 per square foot. So that gives us $24,000 plus the 80 feet across the front times $20 per front foot. That's $1,600. The $1,600 plus the $24,000 makes the answer $25,600. That is the value of the lot. You might see a question similar to this, so I just wanna make sure you understand how to do this type of question. If you can get a lot of these math questions correct, you're gonna easily pass this exam. A realtor has been selling homes for 28 years and has sold over 400 homes in her career. After going on a listing appointment, she can refuse the listing for the following reason. Number one, the religious beliefs of the homeowner. No. Number two, the majority of the other homeowners are minorities. No. Number three, the seller is a minority, no. And number four, the seller wants to list the home for $30,000 higher than the highest sale. And that is your answer. Number 24, the best information source a broker can use in determining a list price for a home is what the owner originally paid for it or the list prices of other homes not in the same area, or the appraised value of a comparable property, or the assessed value of a comparable property. And your best answer is the appraised value of a comparable property. It's our last question. So this is a lengthy one. And I want to put this on here because this is a typical question. You're not going to get an exam of lots of short, short questions. You're going to get an exam with a lot of questions like this. 
And when you see this, it's a little bit stressful at first, like, oh my gosh, I don't wanna read this whole thing. Well, it's not really that hard. So before we read it, thanks for watching this video. Please check out the other links at the bottom of this video in the description of it and go right into studying more questions. I will say this, the more questions that you study, lots of questions, you will pass this test with flying colors. You don't have to get all of them correct. That's, that's something I want you to keep in mind. You do not have to get all of them correct. Just get enough correct to pass the exam. So let's read this. Number 25, in appraising a home, the appraiser notes a patio on the subject property worth $5,000 compared to a comparable property that does not. However, the comparable property has a fireplace worth $7,000 that the subject property does not have. Which of the following adjustments would be correct in appraising the home based on the market data approach? Number one, add $7,000 to the subject, subtract $5,000 from the comparable. Number two, subtract $7,000 from the subject, add 5,000 to the comparable. Number three, subtract $2,000 from the comparable. Or number four, add $2,000 to the comparable. Now that sounds overwhelming, but this question is not that hard. If it said, add $5,000 to the subject and subtract 7,000 from the comparable, that would have been a correct answer. And that would be the same thing as number three, subtract $2,000 from the comparable. That's your correct answer because you're going to give your subject $5,000 more. But the comparable has this fireplace of $7,000 that your house doesn't have. So you gotta remove the 7,000 off the comparable. The difference between that 7,000 and 5,000 is subtracting 2,000 from the comparable. That one is not that hard, but don't let yourself get overwhelmed with all that. It's just, that one's just kind of a logical question. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching my video. Please subscribe and go pass that test.